It's really moving to uh, be here today and to see so many people in the room. Thank you, Autumn and Andre, for co emceeing I do want to acknowledge, uh, in my way, several people who are here today, uh, including his honor, the Honorable Russ Morasti. Thank you so much for joining us. I'll be giving you a proper introduction in a minute, but we're looking forward very much to hearing from you. Uh, his Worship Mayor Charlie Clark, who has done so much for reconciliation in this city, as I'm sure you all know, and uh, is a great partner representing the city, a great partner with this university. We work very closely together and we're all beneficiaries of it. Uh, Phil Fontaine, who has done so much for Indigenous people in this country, particularly in the last few decades, uh, this country will not look the same and in a very positive way because of all that you have done. And it's a real privilege to have you here today. And his partner, Kathleen Mahoney, both of them will be speaking to us later today. And I look forward to that very much. Willie Ermine as well, thank you very much, sir, for being here from First Nations University. And elders Louise Half, who said those special words to us this morning, and Norm Fleury, from whom we will hear a little bit later on today. Thank you very much. And Louise neglected to mention, because um, she's humble, that she also received an honorary degree from um, the University of Saskatchewan, which is the highest honor that this university can bestow. That happened last June. The work of our elders, including Louise and Norm, uh, is so important for us. It's very much appreciated, and we would not be where we are today if not for the lifetimes of experience and teaching that you have given us. So thank you very much. And thank you to this morning's performers of uh, the honor song, Roland, who it was not mentioned, was uh, our USSU president last year. I really appreciated and benefited from working closely with him. Thank you very much, Roland, who was also the fourth indigenous USSU president at this university. And Tawny, for that uh, wonderful Métis national anthem, we could sit here and listen to the two of you all morning. We've invited four individuals to serve as witnesses, as you heard, for today, and thank you to all of them for their time and ongoing commitment. Eugene Archon, traditional knowledge keeper, and like a good friend and a good witness, he told me my hair wasn't looking very good this morning. <laughs> it's been a tough day for me. And it's only nine o'clock or whatever it is. Uh, Regan Rodmasponis, who is the uh, president of the USSU and the fifth indigenous president of the USSU. We're getting there, everybody. Um, Marilyn Poitras, director of the Indigenous Law Center, thank you very much for being here and for all that you have done for the country, and Brian Ketcher as well from University Relations. Today marks our third annual Building Reconciliation Internal Forum. Just a little bit of history on this event. Following the release of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission 94 calls to action in June 2015, this university hosted its Building Reconciliation National Forum. Blaine Fable was our chancellor at the time. He was a driver, as was Eugene. The two of them really together, uh, drivers behind uh, the existence of that event, which had never been held before. And um, it was to identify the ongoing work that is needed to be done with universities across Canada. So we had indigenous student leaders, we had indigenous thought leaders, we had presidents from across the country and officials from various sectors. And Senator Sinclair was here. That's where, as many of you have heard me repeat, he said very famously that education is the key to reconciliation. It was in this room. And uh, commitment came from that forum to host an internal reconciliation forum every year at this university. And hence, this is the third. In 2017, the U of S hosted its first annual internal forum where faculty and staff and students reflected on the work that was happening nationally and locally, and where they were asked to consider what was still needed at this university to undertake indigenization and reconciliation on this campus, and much is. 
In 2018, these conversations continued and they set up the framework, framework for future forums. To the TRC Commission, reconciliation is about, and this is the language you find there, establishing and maintaining a mutually respectful relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples in this country. In order for that to happen, there has to be awareness and knowledge of our past stories, which form the many experiences and truths that are evident today. In addition, there has to be acknowledgement of the harm that has been inflicted, atonement for damaged relationships that colonial systems have caused, and action to change behavior. And I go back to the fact that universities have to play their role, and this one, I like to think, is. The university community embraces Manicetawin through active and respectful communication by learning from our indigenous peoples, elders, traditional knowledge keepers, language teachers, leaders, and community members, and I'm often saying to them every opportunity I get, and publicly every opportunity I get, that that is how we are moving forward, by listening to our indigenous leaders, and by taking an integrated holistic approach to respectful and constructive engagement, and by helping to enact nothing about us without us, a meaningful statement that was devised uh, among other places at that first National Building Reconciliation Forum and continues with and for us today. Now in 2020, our student enrollment continues to grow. We are seeing a record number of students attend the University of Saskatchewan. It's important to say that, but it's more important to say that that number does not tell a complete story and that we are not hoping that Indigenous students will merely come to this university, but that they will be successful at this university, that the retention rate gaps between Indigenous and non-Indigenous students will be fully closed, and that Indigenous students will be supported for success here and go on to lead influential lives. As the first day of classes in September tell us, Indigenous student enrollment was up by 6.1% over last year, we can recognize that there is much reconciliatory work occurring at the university now. This work requires a sense of patience and also impatience. It's a mixture of the two. And as time goes on, possibly more impatience than patience. I think it's great that we are here together and that we are moving together in the right direction and that we are doing it in a good way. And this is one example of doing it in a good way. Much progress has been made by and with Indigenous communities, and part of that work means engaging in storytelling and being bold, really being bold, in the sharing of successes. Yes, we have said collectively that reconciliation will take a long time, but if we do it with respect, if we do it with community, if we do it with humility, we will be building for centuries, and so in closing, I would like to share that I truly believe that an inclusive and welcoming culture, one that fosters a sense of belonging, will lead to systemic and system-based transformation. The deep-seated change that is required for sustained reconciliation. The discussions, like you will have today, will help lead the university, and it is my hope that the impact will be felt widely. I want to thank Jackie Ottman for all the work that she and her team have done, Candace Waskas Laverty as well, and to the members of their organizing committee who set this day in motion for us. And thank you very much to the volunteers and employees whose efforts and care will contribute to our work today. And thank you to all of you who are here today spending your valuable time doing something extraordinarily valuable for all of us. I want now to introduce His Honor, the Honorable Russ Morasti, our Lieutenant Governor. We are so privileged to have him in the room to speak to us, and we are so privileged to have him as this province's Lieutenant Governor. A few facts about him, although I suspect that he will be telling his story in his own way in his remarks to us. He was raised in La Ronge and is a member of the Lac La Ronge Indian Band, his first language is Woodland Cree. His grandparents led a traditional life of fishing 
hunting and trapping. His mother modeled a strong work ethic, and from her and his grandparents, he learned to value a connection to the land and the importance of hospitality and community service. His honor joined the Royal Canadian Mounted Police in 1976 and was one of only two Indigenous cadets in his troop at that time. He served in various roles across the country, including as Director General of Nat Nat National Aboriginal Policing Services and as Commanding Officer of F Division in Saskatchewan. Over his 36-year career, his honor was posted to seven provinces, performed duties in every province and territory, and participated in an exchange with the Northern Territory Police Service in Australia. He retired from the RCMP as Assistant Commissioner in 2013. Following his retirement, his honor continued to devote himself to the residents of Saskatchewan by helping lead the student first engagement process and the valuable perspective shared during that process informed the development of a province-wide education strategy. He has served as a member of the League of Educational Administrators, Directors and Superintendents and as a board member on the Community Safety Knowledge Alliance. In recognition of his outstanding contributions, his honour received both the Queen's Golden Jubilee and Diamond Jubilee medals, as well as the Meritorious Service Medal. His honour leads a very active lifestyle and regularly participates in running and cross-country skiing marathon events. He and his wife, her honour, Donna Morasti, have a home in La Ronge and they have two children and two grandchildren. I know that his honour has many hundreds, not just dozens, but many hundreds of commitments a year in his role as our Lieutenant Governor, and it's our privilege that he honours us with his presence and his words today. Please help me in welcoming to the stage his honour, Russ Morasti. Elder, thank you for the prayer, the honor song, as well as the Metis National Anthem. <coughs> President Stoichev, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It's, it really is an honor for me to be here this morning and before I start, I just want to say that uh, Donna is usually with me as uh, if you're following kind of our work. <clears throat> she, uh, she and I decided when we were presented with this opportunity that we would take it on as a team and we, and we continue to do that. Uh, unfortunately, she couldn't make it this morning because of another commitment. Uh, but I am very pleased to be here with you today. I want to thank the organizers for the invitation and certainly the warm welcome. It, uh, it really is humbling to be welcomed in such a manner and, and I do really appreciate that. Thank you. And thank you for everybody that's present here today and making reconciliation a priority. Really the foundation for me and we'll obviously through discussions and and not only today, but uh, previously and into the future, people will talk about what reconciliation means to them. And for me, fundamentally, it's about relationships. It's about understanding each other and getting to know each other better. I tend to simplify things in this very complicated world that we walk in and live in, uh, but I think it's important that uh, we look at it, each of us, in, in the way that, uh, that we can. So today, I've been asked to tell my story, and I'm not here to lecture about reconciliation, but about reflecting on my story, I could see and I can see elements that really fit into that discussion, that conversation. And so I'm going to try to do that today. You heard a little bit about my bio from the president, 
and I'll just expand on that a little bit. I was born in Larange and raised uh, on the adjacent First Nation, and Larange is uh, somewhat unique in that respect, where the communities of Larange and Larange literally surround and are adjacent to the First Nation community that exists there. Lac Larange Indian Band is comprised of six separate communities that are spread out throughout that region, but one further to the south, uh, north of Prince Albert, uh, Little Red. I was raised in my grandparents' household, a small two-room house on the reserve with no electricity, no running water, and which was common in those days, and we didn't know any different, at least for a period until we started to interact with families and students uh, from the adjoining communities, and certainly they lived uh, a very different life. But it's not that we had any issue with that. We didn't uh, hold, begrudge them for, for having what they did. But it caused us to think about why, why there were differences in how, how we lived. My grandparents spoke only Cree. They didn't go to school. They weren't affected directly, at least, by residential schools, although the following generations uh, certainly were. And they were a major influence in my upbringing, and I'm affected and impacted to this very day by, by them. And they, and they stand with me here as I speak with you. They were very generous people, welcoming everyone that, that came to our door. And certainly that, along with the word respect we've already heard, were fundamental to my upbringing. And respect for everyone. They lived the true traditional lifestyle. And I describe it in this way. There, there were the generation that truly lived that traditional lifestyle. They were so connected to the land, that they knew nothing else. And for me, that was so impactful. And as I said, it really has an impact, and it really frames who I am to this very day. So we lived in a small house, as I mentioned, uh, quite a number of us, uh, and like I said, I didn't know any different. But when I was four years old, I was struck with tuberculosis, and my first time leaving the community and, and taken all the way to Fort San in the Coppell Valley. I don't remember much of that experience. I was there almost a year, I'm told, and immersed in that different world, different culture, and I guess that was really evident when I was finally did go home and the nurse took me to the same house and as I got out of this car I declared in English that this was not where I lived, this was not my home. And obviously very upset because it was so different and uh, my grandmother took me under her wing and really uh, made that transition I guess a little bit smoother for me. I began school in Larange, uh, but after grade two, I went in a different direction, back south to Prince Albert to the residential school that was there. And for several years, went to that school, and then finally returned to Larange to finish elementary and high school. Now in school, obviously, you know, we talk about residential school, we talk about just being immersed in the the school that was in the town of Larange, because at that time, I don't, don't think, or I'm not aware of First Nations having their own schools as they do now. And so we were immersed in, in a culture again that was integrated with the communities of Larange and Arange and the families and students that came from there. So I had that exposure early, early on. I did okay academically and really uh, quite well in sports, very uh, important, and I think that's probably the thread that kept me in school as it did for, for many uh, of my family members and friends from the reserve. And through that, through not only the education system but also, also through the sports, I developed uh, long-lasting friendships, at some of which I still have today. I do recall though, and this is something that uh, really I think about quite often, and although I know some of the answers, I still wonder, and, it, and it's uh, 
it's a good point of conversation, I suppose, that going into high school, there were quite a number of us from the reserve that were attending school. And when I graduated from grade 12, I was the only one. And again, you know, many reasons that we could talk about and debate, but uh, certainly something that I reflected on, not only at that time, but even to this day, as we talk about graduation rates, whether at the secondary or post-secondary levels, certainly the, the picture is much brighter. I was encouraged by teachers to go to university. It was a concept that was totally foreign to me, to my family. It wasn't like we sat around the kitchen table talking about, you know, what are you going to do in university or college? It was really a concept that, that was non-existent. And it was enough that I had finished high school and my family was proud of me for that. And so, after some thought, and certainly because of the support I had from teachers, I said, you know, I think I should give this a try. So I actually came here. And for a year, did okay academically, but I was somewhat lost. It wasn't a place that I felt really comfortable, probably because of the number of people that were here, mainly. You know, just the uh, kind of the new world that I was uh, immersed in. And I found it to be a very isolating experience in spite of uh, being able to do okay. And sometime during that year, I said, you know, I'm I just uh, not comfortable. And uh, although I did finish the year, I said, I need to get out and maybe do something uh, more productive, just the way I thought at the time, uh, which meant to me to find a job and to support myself. And looked at all the options, and as you've heard, I joined the RCMP, and I was uh, accepted and started you know, a whole different journey. I learned many, many different things in the RCMP, and I kind of frame it in a, in a couple different ways, uh, but one mainly when I'm talking about my experience there versus where I came from. And we had this kind of paradigm, if you will, that we talked about, you know, living in two worlds. Uh, there was an RCMP world and there was the other world where other people lived and did their thing. Uh, and for me, I, there was a third part of that, and that was my, my indigenous, my First Nation self or being. And so I had these three kind of perspectives and realities that I had to contend with. And I don't want that to sound negative because I think it made me a, a fuller, more complete person and certainly made me better in terms of the work that I was doing in the RCMP. As you've heard, I've, we worked in every province, or I worked in every province and territory, and we lived in, in seven provinces, right from Newfoundland to British Columbia. And you know, when I reflect on that, when Don and I talk about it, and the kids even, it's, it's really about the experience that we had with different people in different communities across this amazing country that we live in. And really reinforced and confirmed what I've always believed, that Canada is probably the greatest country in the world. And I say that sincerely, although we talk about reconciliation and some of the challenges that obviously we've faced, Indigenous people have faced in this, in this country. But I look around the world and, and see the strife that exists and people, Indigenous people, maybe not having it, uh, you know, quite as good. Not to say that we're, we're where we need to be. But uh, in traveling to Australia, you know, that, that confirmed that belief for me. Same challenges, same struggles, same colonial history. And it was amazing to be on the other side of the world, but really stepping into a, a world that I was quite comfortable in, if that's even a way to put it. Familiar, maybe, is a better word. I finished my career in the RCMP as a commanding officer, which is the head of the RCMP for the province of Saskatchewan. The first time that an Indigenous person had uh, occupied such a position in Canada. 
And when I, again, I keep going back in terms of reflecting in the context of reconciliation, you know, how did I, how did I get there? Donna and I even talk about that, even just the other day, talking about our roles in this office. How did we get here and what allowed us to get to this point? And we go back to our upbringing. Donna is, uh, if you're not familiar, she's from Cumberland House, born and raised there, although she had to leave the community to finish high school as well. Not through residential school, but because they didn't have a high school in Cumberland House and they were boarded out in different communities and in her case was Nippon and Prince Albert to finish. So a similar experience, but a bit, bit of a different context. And so we thought about a lot of different things, I guess, but really it was about our willingness to learn. We're both very curious by nature. So we go to Newfoundland, what's Newfoundland about? What makes it strong? What, what is it about Newfoundland that people talk about? And well, it's, it's the history, it's, it's the fishers, it's, it's that, but at the same time, you're confronted with the reality around the Beatics that literally disappeared. And for what reason? And again, a convers another conversation that we could have. And then moving across the country to northern British Columbia, where today we see some challenges for sure, uh, which we can't avoid. And seeing there the tremendous work ethic of people working in, in the logging industry and others. And across to Thompson, Manitoba, where it was mining. Same thing, hardworking people. And then back to Saskatchewan, a short time in Alberta, southern Alberta. And that's what came out for us, is our willingness to learn, our willingness to engage with people and to be part of those communities. But at the same time, learning that, you know, there's something amiss here, particularly in the economic kind of activities in these different regions, there was a group of people missing, indigenous people. And again, within our family talking about that. So, without getting too deep into that conversation, part of my journey has been about learning and not ignoring the past and certainly not dwelling on it, but appreciating how it framed me as an individual, but also my community and how we could fit into this broader society and country that we know as Canada. We talk a lot about that and our children who are grown up and have their own children and although there were a couple of difficult moves, they certainly emphasized with us that they wouldn't change it for the world. And it comes back to that, about the experiences that they shared with us, that we shared with them as we moved across the country. So, back to Donna. Donna and I have been married for 42 years. I said she was raised in Cumberland House, the oldest community in Saskatchewan. So a different history again in terms of the fur trade and that interaction with Europeans and how that informed that community or shaped that community and other communities throughout the North. She came from a family that really encouraged advanced or further education from grade, from high school, from grade 12. And she became a licensed practical nurse and the rest of her family, you know, have achieved uh, different levels of post-secondary education. And, and that came from, as she talks about it, her parents, but mostly her father, who was, a, who was a veteran, World War II, and came back with these ideas of this big world out there, the war aside and its impacts, because he was severely wounded, which affected him for the rest of his life. He recognized that there was a bigger world out there, but in order to be a part of it, to be able to contribute, you had to further your education. And they lived by that as a family. We are very proud of our children, Matthew and Jennifer, and our, our grandchildren, Grace 
in Jackson. Uh, as you heard from the bio that was uh, presented, we are very active. We, as a family, participate in many, uh, I'll qualify that, fewer, there was many, <laughs> uh, marathon type of events. And uh, part of that comes from not only wanting to be fit, but also when I go out there and I'm skiing on a trail north of Larange by myself in the woods, it's like, it's really, it's hard to describe. It's a feeling that almost overcomes me in the sense that one, I'm thankful for the ability to be out there, but thankful for that environment and its pristine state and being able to connect with it. And I go back in my mind at least, firstly to my grandparents who lived that in that environment, who knew nothing else and were strong for it. But I was, just a, a side story, I was invited to a fishing camp in northern Saskatchewan, Hatchet Lake actually, and we were having a bit of a walking tour of the camp and we walked into the dining room and there were several several, more than several pictures, photographs on the wall. So of course, being curious, I walked up and, and I, there was one that really just grabbed my attention. Leading up to that, the manager of the camp had been describing kind of the history and it struck me as unusual that most of the guides, most of the employees were actually from the Stanley Mission LaRange area. And because we were Hatchet Lake is really north and in Denny country. And they said, no, that's the relationship that the original owner had with people from the LaRange Stanley Mission area, and he convinced people to come up there, as well, people from Stanley Mission actually trapped up there. And the picture, to get, that, get to that, was of an older couple sitting there on the steps of one of, one of the cabins and it really just uh, kind of set me back because I, I recognized them. And they were my great aunt and uncle on the McLeod side of my family. And the story is they used to, they had a trap line up in that area and they used to paddle for 300 miles every fall before freeze up and set up their camp there and then work all winter sell their furs, there was a little trading post there, and then paddle back. And how does that relate to marathon skiing or running? Well, when I'm struggling and hitting that wall as it's known, if you're involved in those types of events, that's where I gain my strength from. I think about these people that were able to do that year in, year out, and didn't know any different, and but that was who they were. That's strong, resilient people that did what they had to do to, to survive and to support their families. So that was, got a little bit off track there, but um, you know, it's a story that I love to share because it just uh, demonstrates uh, where I come from, you know, the people that I come from. So to, uh, kind of start to wrap it up a bit. You know, we talk about achievements, we talked about, well, how did, or ask the, through the question out there, how did we get here? And I always use we, because it, it always has been about Donna and me, particularly since uh, my RCMP journey started. We talked about supporting each other, and certainly her support allowed me to get to where I did. But it's support of others. So I go back to the reserve at LaRange, my grandparents, my family, recognizing the value of education. I had the privilege last night of hosting an event at Government House in Regina, and an elder from Niganit uh, was there to talk about uh, her experiences, and she talked about not going to school, but insisting that all of her children and grandchildren finish at least high school, but then go on to post-secondary. And in talking to her, it was, even though she wasn't in the system, whether it was res residential school or otherwise, she recognized the value 
of education and the need to become educated and to fit in and to be part, a contributing part of this world that we live in. So again, reinforced my belief always about education. And then, as I talked about teachers supporting me throughout my career in the RCMP, key people at key times, and working through personal self-doubts about my own ability to occupy those higher level positions. And so sometimes we need that kind of a objective perspective or reminder that no, we, you can do it. You can uh, do that uh, job or fill that role. And so that word that comes out of that obviously is relationships, whether it's with family, with teachers, with educators, with professionals that you work with, colleagues, and, and even now as I take on this role, as we take on this role and travel this province, interacting with the great people of this province and others who come to visit. It's a t tremendous privilege. You know, as a member of the Lac Laurent Indian Band, as I've stated, it is a deep honor to represent Queen Elizabeth here in this province. And I have to be very honest, when I first got the call about letting my name stand, Donna and I talked about a bit of a, I guess, a personal dilemma, or almost a conflict, in trying to reconcile being a First Nations person, but also being the representative of the Queen, and also acknowledging the history you know, of the treaties and that people coming together to, in a good way, to set the future, a good future for, for, all, for all of us here in the province or in this country. And knowing that that necess that's not necessarily happened to the degree that, that was envisioned. But in spite of that, and I think probably I made that decision when I joined the RCMP that, you know, we can all contribute in some way. And regardless of, you know, what's going around us or what's happening, the challenges that we face collectively. You know, we have to find a way of working through these difficult times, including the present, and finding a way that where all people are respected, their perspectives are respected, and I'm sure that at the end of the day, we will come out of this uh, better and stronger. So, to uh, close off, it is customary for the Lieutenant Governor of the province, any Lieutenant Governor for that matter, to bring greetings on behalf of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, Queen of Canada, and I do that now. I have started, or I did start a practice right from the beginning. You know, I'll just back up a little bit here. At my installation, there's very much ceremony, as you saw here, that, you know, very limited as to what you saw in terms of the ceremony and, and the protocol. But I step into this office, which has tradition and protocol that's embedded for hundreds of years and based on the British colonial system. And with that comes, you know, different things that you have to do, and in this case, that you should wear. And when I was being briefed about my installation, it was, you know, you have to wear this morning suit. And I thought, morning suit? You know, when I put on a suit, it's for the entire day. <laughs> I mean, it's, what's a morning suit? Well, you know, it's that really formal coat and it's got tails. Oh, yeah, okay, I, I think I've seen pictures of that. And uh, you get a vest and uh, you do get to wear your medals, which I have several of based on my service. And I thought, well, that part's good. Uh, what about shoes? Well, you, you wear these shiny uh, shoes. I mean, you mean like the ones that look like they're plastic? And uh, yeah, but that's not that's not what it is. It, you know, they're just nice looking shoes. And I said, uh, and it popped into my head. I said, well, can I wear moccasins? And my principal secretary looked at me for hesitated for a second. And said, why not? I said, good. That's what I'll do. So I actually uh, 
or I didn't, uh, Donna called a friend of ours in, in Grandmother's Bay, which is uh, another community of the Lac Lorange Indian Band, and asked if she could make some moccasins for me, and which she did. So going into that legislature with the morning suit, but moccasins, I was confronted by reporters. Uh, what are you doing? Are you making a statement? I said, no, it's just who I am. And so I think uh, that's related. When we talk about reconciliation and, and, and changing the status quo and, and not necessarily disrespectfully challenging the status quo, but saying, you know, we can do this, but incorporate something that's a part of us. And so uh, proudly, I, I don't wear them all the time because I don't want to wear them out, uh, but uh, I will at, at different events. So back to the greeting uh, from Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth. I want to share that with you in Cree. And again, that's another aspect of this work that I thought, you know, why can't I do that in my own language? Even though people may not understand, it's something that I want to do and I want to share. So I'll do that. <laughs> Thank you very much. A blanket on behalf of um, Dr. Jacqueline Ottman and the Vice Provost of the University of Saskatchewan.